Thanks for having me, everyone. Isn't it good to be back at conferences again? In a room packed with people. So I'm super excited for that. And yeah, thanks for showing up in those big numbers uh, to my talk on context mapping. And this is not going to be a, a PowerPoint bonanza kind of a talk. Um, I want to make an engaging talk together with you. So usually I would tell you, toss away your smartphones and store them in the bag and just listen to me. But no, pull out your smartphones and you can join this talk. Yeah, And um, I will have a bunch of live questionnaires and feedback stuff on that, so you can participate in the talk. And while I do that, I want to give you a personal notice. This talk was very, very short of being cancelled. Why? Because the wife of my mother has passed away over the weekend, and she was always excited when I was traveling to conferences. And she, she always said, oh, is there another video of you giving a talk? And oh, those many people. So I want to dedicate this talk to Marianne, rest in peace. And um, yeah, just a, a few words about myself. I'm Michael Plute. I work at a company called InnoQ. I would say I'm quite engaged in the DDD community for quite some years. And this context mapping thing is something that always, I, I think, uh, caught my attention to a certain degree. And um, so I want to give you an introduction to that. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to you to give me an indication about your knowledge. How would you rate your knowledge on domain-driven design in general, bounded context, context maps, and the, the standard software architecture stuff like cohesion, coupling, modularity, and so on. So how would you rate your knowledge in that area? So I see quite, of a, quite folks having a decent knowledge, yeah, mid-knowledge about DDD. Of course, we're in the foundations track. Um, boundary context, not so much. Cohesion coupling, yeah, also present. But context maps, yeah, not so much. So you're in the perfect talk here. Yeah, so because I will give you an introduction uh, to context maps. And before we do that, I want to revisit some basics. Uh, Robert Frost once said, good fences make good neighbors. And you may wonder why, yeah, I, um, why I bring up this quote. And let me just smash in another quote um, or another idea by Daniel H. Pink, who wrote a book about what motivates people. And it's, he came up with the idea that it's about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And isn't that something that we want to achieve with teams in an organization? Isn't this autonomy thing something that appears again and again and again and again in the agenda of this amazing conference here? Yeah? So how do we achieve that? Yeah, one of the ideas yeah, that we very often see in the DDD space is that we say, hey, we need some decent boundaries in which teams can achieve. And we very often say autonomy, but also let's expand this idea to mastery and purpose. And one of those ideas yeah, is the idea of the bounded context. And in order to guide you there, yeah, Maxime, my good friend, is also doing a talk right now in the Red Room about this beast here, about the domain-driven design starter modeling process. And that's something that I want to really give you as a first very, very big hint. Yeah? Um, check out this GitHub repository. It's all Creative Commons, yeah, you can copy stuff from there, you can use it on your own. It's a community effort by many folks who are doing talks and workshops at this conference, yeah, including me as well. And we will very strongly focus on this middle part here. And yeah, one idea is there, the bounded context. So the starter modeling process guides you at moving towards good context boundaries and then moving to code with tactical design. And a perspective on bounded context, which I personally like quite a bit, is that the bounded context is a boundary for a model expressed in a consistent, ubiquitous language, and which is tailored around a specific purpose. You remember the Daniel H. Quink, uh, Daniel H. Pink thing? There was purpose in that. We have purpose in here as well. It's an interesting take. So. Let's dissect this briefly before we actually get into context maps. Yeah? So 
Boundary context is a boundary, yeah? like a module. A module is also supposed to be a boundary around a model. And a model, yeah, in the DDD perspective, yeah, is a behavioral model. Yeah, containing it's all about business rules, decisions, certain policies in a consistent language. A language consists of terminology, definitions, and meanings. A widespread example for that is, for instance, the tomato. What is a tomato? A fruit or a vegetable? Yeah? Most people will probably say it's a vegetable because you take a look at that from a cooking perspective. Who would expect a tomato to be in a fruit salad? That would be a little bit of a strange fruit salad, maybe. Yeah? Um, but from the botanical perspective of biologic, tomato is actually a fruit. If you take a look into the time management context, maybe someone of you works with the time management method Pomodoro. A tomato represents a unit of, 12 minute, uh, of 25 minutes of uninterrupted work. And if we go back to the medieval ages where theater plays were on marketplaces, in this context, what is a tomato that is flying to the stage? Negative feedback. So I hope I don't get any flying tomatoes my direction yeah, today. Uh, but I don't see any tomatoes around here, so <laughs> I'm relaxed. Um, and it's aimed at a specific purpose. So we want to do things yeah, where the language, the rules, and the specific model are tailored to a certain purpose. So we don't want to do this thing where we're maximizing reusability no matter what, and let's build a, US, a, a, a fruit, a, a cooking, botanics, time management, feedback tomato. No, let's build specific models here. Yeah? And when we take a look at yeah, this thing, this bounded context, there is a very new perspective as well, which is, I would say, three years old now, yeah? posted by the uh, amazing folks, Matthew Emmanuel from the Team Topologies book, they said, hey, maybe a bounded context can also be seen as a team first boundary. And I said, yeah, we need boundaries in which teams can achieve autonomy, mastery, and purpose. But so far, what we have is a very static view on this matter. Yeah, so let's define a boundary. Let's aim towards a purpose. Yeah, let's have a dedicated language for that. But how about the dynamics between those boundaries? Yeah, that's missing here. Yeah, that's, that's something we can't see here. And obviously, on this talk, I need to come up with the good old Conway's Law quote. Yeah? Any organization that designs a system defined broadly will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Yeah, it's in, uh, from Melvin Conway's uh, paper, How Committees Work. Yeah, a very, very amazing piece, yeah? a great uh, paper. And the thing that gets very often misunderstood here is that Conway's law is not about the org chart, yeah? which is also a static view on things. No, it's about the dynamics in that org chart. Yeah? It's about the communication structure. What I'm always sometimes choking around a bit is, I would say, yeah, I would also take a look at the floor plan of an organization. Which teams sit next to each other and which teams share a coffee kitchen with each other? Because what's happening in a coffee kitchen? Communication. Yeah? And I think that's a dynamic, that's a perspective. And I think communication can be in a high bandwidth way where two teams talk a lot to each other, or in a low bandwidth way, where, where there is not a lot of talking between the teams. And this is yeah, where the context map basically comes into play. Also, a quote from the Team Topologies book, as an architect, you should be thinking, which team interaction modes are appropriate for these two teams? What kind of communication do we need between those two parts of the system and between those two teams? So again, here, those dynamics. Yeah? And that's something that um, is very old in, in domain-driven design. Context maps have been in the blue book by Eric Evans, which came out, I think, 19 to 20 years ago or something like that. So that's old stuff. That's nothing revolutionary. That's nothing new. This stuff, what I'm going to present here, 
has been around for all this time. And I think I always say that context maps have been a, a little bit of a hidden gem in the uh, uh, in the in the DDD space, yeah. Everyone has always been looking at the tactical patterns like aggregates and also the strategic stuff like bounded context, subdomains, subdomain categories, and stuff like that. But I think there is a lot of value, yeah, in this perspective. And I would say let's um, let's dig into that, yeah. And yeah, what kinds of relationships between systems and teams do context map address? Let's check this out. A very simple and a very obvious perspective yeah, is you have a bunch of systems or you go a little bit deeper into bounded context. It depends on the granularity of your deployment unit and they call each other. I think those are perspectives that we have seen all the time. Yeah? I think in nearly every office where some software architects have been sitting, you have probably all seen those big printed a0 pages like this is our complex system landscape. This system is calling that and they call that and they call that. And most of the time no one was working with that. It was just a poster to show we're dealing with complexity here. Yeah, um, being a little bit sarcastic. Or we publish some events and those are reacting on them. I think this is a very widespread perspective that everyone has seen. But there are more perspectives to that. Another perspective is um, the propagation of models. On every one of those uh, interfaces, you will get a certain model. So when you call, for instance, the Google Maps API, you will obtain a model from Google about a point of interest, about the route, and so on. And that's, first of all, Google's model. Now, what are the consumers doing with those models? Yeah? Are they just copying them into them? Are they transforming those models? Yeah. So in, th in this example here, yeah, where we have a, a German credit rating agency called the Schufa, yeah, they, where you can get a quote, hey, how credit worthy is Michael, for instance? Yeah, is he a credit worthy person or, oh, better stick away from that guy yeah, with the long hair. Yeah, maybe let's not do business with him. Yeah? And they answer with that in that, in the, in, in that model yeah, on a synchronous call. And you may now say, oh, we're doing event-based microservices. Yeah, we work with Apache Kafka. We're decoupled per definition because we're just doing those things. No, you're not. Because you can still do the whole model propagation thing in an event-based system. Yeah? So you pack the credit application form into the event and then copy it further. And again, you have a high degree of coupling. That's a very interesting perspective, which the context maps also uh, address. And then, yeah, we have some communication things. Yeah, between teams there is communication going on. For instance, one team, the credit agency, agency team, says, "Hey, we'll adjust the interface and the underlying model with the next release." The other team says, "Hey, no problem. Yeah, just send us the documentation. We'll cater for that. We'll adjust our code so that nothing breaks." Or, you have a different kind of communication. So we're going to deprecate that domain event and replace it with a new one in the next release and the other team says, hey, no, hey, stop, you can't do that. We don't have the time, we don't have the budget. And by the way, the risk is too high for us and if you do that, we are going to escalate that to the management. So we're raising a veto here. Yeah? That's also a very interesting team perspective. Yeah? And yeah, you can also have a perspective where one team does something and it has an impact on another team. Yeah? And so, for instance, yeah, the credit agency will replace the web service by some RESTful HTTP resources next week, and it has an impact on the bank. They need to do something, and they may not be very happy with that, and the credit agency couldn't care less about that. Oh, their problem, not ours. Yeah? But when the bank changed some of their scoring rules, it doesn't matter for the credit agency at all. Yeah? So now let's go into, f into the first very specific context mapping thing. So those four perspectives, yeah? um, dependencies between teams, communication, model propagation, providing of APIs, yeah? they are being addressed by the context map. And the first thing that uh, the context map addresses are certain dependencies between teams. 
One dependency is a mutual dependency. Yeah? So let's say I am a team and you are a team. Yeah? When I do something, you need to do something as well. And when you do something, I need to do something as well. Yeah? So we have a mutual dependency. Obviously, the both of us, we will have to talk a lot together. Yeah? We need to coordinate our efforts. We need to coordinate our testing, maybe infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So um, we are highly coupled, so to say. But on the other hand, yeah, if you take a look at the, uh, let's say, the calendar teams from Apple, Google, and Microsoft, yeah, iCloud calendar, Google calendar, and the Exchange calendar by Microsoft, I would say those teams, they are free. Yeah? I, I, we don't have a global yearly calendar software release day where everyone needs to address their calendars. That would be horrible. Yeah? It would be something for the evening news or something. So please update your calendars or everything will break. That's not going to happen. But nevertheless, I can send a calendar invite to you, 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 and you. Yeah? And I'll probably do that yeah? because us as InnoQ, we are sponsors of DDD Europe. And in the goodie bag of DDD Europe, there is a voucher for a free hands-on context mapping session remotely with me on July the 5th. And if you sign up for that, you will get a calendar invite from my exchange calendar. Yeah? <laughs> and I don't care if you have a Google calendar, an iCloud calendar, or anything like that. Yeah? I don't care about that. So those teams, they are free. And then we have the upstream downstream dependency. So let me pick someone else. Oh, let me grab you. So I do something, I do a code change, and it doesn't affect you. You don't care. Yeah? So I change something, you couldn't care less. But when you ch change something, it affects me. I need to adjust something. Let's, let me give you a, a concrete, a specific example for that. So um, let's say we have uh, one team which is responsible for filling out an application form for a mortgage loan. A yeah, complex form, four pages, you need to provide a lot of information. And then we have a scoring team which, which is responsible for a scoring bounded context. And when you change that form, it will probably affect me and my scoring rules because I need to change something in there. But when I change some of my calculations, you couldn't care less. Think about the rivers. Yeah? I live in the city of Nuremberg in Germany, and there is the river called the Pegnitz floating through our city. And our neighbor city, Fürth, yeah, um, is downstream of Nuremberg. So when I toss a small boat into the Pegnitz and place a case of let's say, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beers on that boat, and the boat floats from Nuremberg to Fürth. It affects Fürth, so they can grab a cold one. Yeah? And they will probably be very happy. But in soccer or football, however you call it, there's a big rivalry between the teams. Now, what would rather happen is that the people in Nuremberg, there's a high degree of rivalry between the cities, would toss something really ugly in the Pignitz, yeah, and, the, and the people in Fürth, they would be helpless because they are downstream. Yeah? So upstream, downstream is also a lot about power dynamics uh, between teams. The upstream teams has a lot of power, whereas the downstream team yeah, is sometimes helpless at the mercy of the upstream team. So the context map, in addition to that, yeah, contains nine patterns. Yeah? And I will walk you now through all of those nine patterns yeah? to describe those relations in a greater depth. So don't worry, I will try to make that. I mean, usually explaining patterns can get pretty boring and dry and so on. I will try to do that as entertaining as possible for you because I don't want to kill all your energy in the, in the second slot of the conference already. Yeah? But please bear with me. Let's start with a very simple pattern called the open host service. I would say that's a very easy to understand pattern. So you have one bounded context yeah, or a microservice and it provides an API, an interface, yeah, which provides others with a certain set of functionality. Yeah? The important thing is the, bounded con the open host service 
yeah, is an API, an interface that is tailored to many consumers, yeah, not to just you or you or you. No, it's an API that is there, an interface that is there for all of you people. Yeah? Think about the Google Maps API. That's a classic open host yeah? and also a high utilization open host service. Yeah? So usually yeah, on a context map, you visualize this open host thing with uh, a visualization called OHS. Ah, there I have it. There I am. It's called OHS, Open Host Service. And now since you're all, yeah, or most of you are newbies to context mapping, there is a very big heuristic for you. In 99% of the cases, maybe with some additional nines, the team providing the open host service is an upstream team. Yeah, because they have a control over the open host service. So if you leave this talk and apply that stuff in practice next week, yeah, but please no career finishing moves with that stuff, yeah, uh, and you say the open host service is upstream, you're probably right. Yeah, I've seen very rare cases where the open host is in the downstream and that included very powerful regulators. Yeah, where a regulator went to a bank or insurance company and said, okay, you need to provide us with this interface. We define this interface, we define the roadmap, we define the quality criteria for the interface, and you just provide us with that. Yeah, because then the power dynamics change. Yeah? The team which implements the interface actually has no power over the interface. Yeah? So that was when the open host service moved to the downstream team. But that was in, I would say I'm doing context maps now for 13, 15 years or something. That was the only case that I've seen so far where the open host service would move to the downstream team. Now, every, and this upstream downstream relationship, yeah, you see the D, that stands for downstream, and you see the U there, that stands for upstream. Yeah? So we have an open host service being provided by an upstream team, and we have two consumers on that who are in the downstream. Now, with every open host service, you provide a model to the downstream teams. Yeah? In every open host service, there is some model with some data being provided. And now let's switch sides. Let's go down to the downstream team. Yeah? Now, they can do something with that model. And we are now moving into this model propagation relationship that I've described earlier on. I, I would say 10 minutes ago. So one strategy that the downstream team could apply is they can implement an anti-corruption layer. What is the anti-corruption layer all about? First of all, it's visualized as ACL, anti-corruption layer in the context map. So context maps are a visualization technique as well. Yeah, they are uh, a, a dictionary of certain linguistic elements, yeah, of terms. Yeah, they, 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 there are certain names for relationships, but you can also visualize those relationships with context maps. Yeah? And the ACL is basically a model-to-model -model transformation. So we provide, yeah, through the open host service, a model. And the downstream team then goes ahead and transforms that model to something that suits their purpose. Think about the bounded context definition again. Yeah? We want a build that is expressed in a certain ubiquitous language tailored to a specific purpose. Now, that's what's happening down there in the scoring part. That's their purpose, that's their vision. So we have a model to model transformation there. Yeah? Um, however, yeah, an anti corruption layer. Yeah, you may think that's a great idea. That's what I want to do every time. But please be aware, there's also effort involved in that. You need to implement this, and you need to maintain this. So this costs you time and money. An alternative for that would be, you say, ah, screw this. I, I don't want to do that effort thing. Yeah? I don't have the time, I don't have the money, and I don't see the urge to do that. I become a conformist. What does the conformist do? So they take the model from the upstream team, and they just take it. They just work with this. Yeah? Conformist is visualized as CF. Yeah? Conformist. Now, um, 
This is easy. A conformist is always an easy choice. Yeah? This is fast. Yeah? But it leads to a higher degree of coupling. Yeah? Now, let's talk about this coupling thing. Now, this is, a, I would say, a simplified version of, of something you could call a hexagonal architecture, onion architecture, clean architecture. I know there are certain differences, but the, the general idea is very similar between these things. Now, let's see how deep the coupling of those two patterns goes in these architectures. In the conformist, you couple yourself directly up until the core, yeah, the domain model of your architecture. So your coupling goes very deep into your application. And a widespread misconception regarding the uh, anti-corruption layer is that it is about decoupling. In my eyes, there is no decoupling. Yeah? When systems have a connection together, we have a loose coupling. Anti-corruption layer is about loose coupling because yeah, we limit the coupling to the outer yeah, rings of this application, usually on the adapter level. Yeah? So um, if you talk about coupling, the coupling of the conformist goes deeper yeah, into your application. You need to change more. And the the impact of the changes of the conformist is way higher. Yeah, whereas on the anti-corruption layer, you prefer a looser coupling, and the impact of the changes usually ends at your adapter level. Now, I think something that is now in your heads, and I think that applies to most of the people, most of you will think now, having a conformist is an utterly stupid idea. I think that's too simplistic. It depends. Yeah? That's usually the question. There are some heuristics where a conformist may be a good idea. Yeah? So, for instance, you have one bounded context that provides computations that are highly regulated. Yeah, you don't want anyone else to mess around with that. Or you can use a conformist to give certain teams less power or more power as well. Yeah? So, or you just want to save time and money because you say, hey, that external model is good enough for me. I have built some amazing conformists, and I was super happy about those conformists. They worked, they did the job, yeah? mostly in not so strategic areas, and I avoided the extra effort. Now, let me, let's pull out your smartphones again. Yeah? You may rejoin this talk, or join again, I think most of you are still in the talk. So I'll give you a second to pitch in, because we will do something now which is also posted on this DDD crew site. There is um, a, a GitHub project called Context Mapping Quiz, which has been provided generously to the public domain by Nick Tune and Jean Versace, who are both here as well. So make sure to check out their talks and uh, props to them. And I will give you a scenario now. Please take a look at this. Yeah. And please go ahead. And there are yeah, I would say some comments about this context map. And I would like you to choose which ones you see fit. So, let me show the results quickly. Okay, so a lot of you voted for lots of cross-team collaboration needed, yeah, and propagation of models through many contexts, yeah, and basically, yeah, those two here, yeah, um, you you made the absolute uh, right choices here. So, what can happen, yeah, that you will have a hidden coupling between models here in this scenario. So uh, the coupling, yeah, it can trickle down. It can start um, from here, yeah. We have a coupling of some stuff that is here in there. And then, yeah, this model from down here can also be propagated down there through another conformist. And suddenly, yeah, you change something in here 
and a totally nasty bug pops up over there. And everyone is surprised. Oh, how could that have happened? I think you've all been in those situations, haven't you? I've been in those situations countless times, and I cursed like hell when I was supposed to find out where the bug is, <laughs> until I had to find out, oh, it actually happened over there. Yeah? You can visualize these things. And now imagine you doing a big, a big scale IT transformation. You want to revamp an ugly, historically, sometimes hysterically grown monolith. I think you want to know these things. Yeah? How, how this propagation happens in here. Yeah? Let's move on to a different pattern. The shared kernel. That's even a stronger coupling than the conformist. Yeah? With the shared kernel. I physically share an artifact with someone. Yeah? So let's say this conference batch here is a jar file, a jar library in the Java world. Or you can use a DLL or an NPM module, whatever you want to have. So I'm a Java guy. I'm one of those boring dudes who's still doing Java. And um, <laughs> yeah, so that's my shared jar file. And oh, there is a different system here. Yeah, and that system is sitting over here. Can you grab this as well? Yeah, you? So we have a shared kernel. Yeah, we are physically sharing an artifact here. So when I pull, you fly over there. And when you pull, I fly in the audience. You can lose it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I want to decouple myself from you. Yeah? And um, so that's the shared kernel. The shared kernel can be, it's usually visualized as SK, shared kernel. Yeah, no surprises here. And um, it is a high degree of coupling. Yeah, it can happen through shared artifacts or dear historically grown monolith. You love that so much over shared database schemas. Maybe with some stored procedures in them. Yeah, a good stuff. Yeah, high degree of coupling. Yeah, and um, so basically, yeah, this is a clear warning sign. If you want to build want to use domain-driven design to build microservices or self-contained systems or anything like that, avoid shared kernels. You don't want to have that in this area. Nevertheless, there may be some heuristics where a shared kernel can come in handy. Yeah? It's always an it depends thing. Yeah? So for instance, yeah, you have one team being responsible for two or more bounded contexts which, which have a certain overlap in terms of language. Yeah, you may now think, oh, but that's not clear-cut DDD. Yeah, but that's the reality in most projects. Yeah, that's what I see all the time. And I, I think we can't always optimize for absolute purity yeah, in our modeling. Sometimes we have to deal with trade-offs. That's our reality. Yeah? And please also take that advice when you go away from the conference into your day-to-day -day job. Yeah, you will see, you will get inspiration at the conference for many great ideas, but you will not be able to apply everything in perfect purity into practice. That's reality. Yeah? We need to deal with trade-offs, so this may be a trade-off. Yeah? Um, but always avoid shared kernels when two teams are in a competitive relationship. Yeah? So for instance, you're a car maker, an insurance company, a bank, and you have two external vendor companies. Yeah? So we have one external vendor, yeah, that's those rows sitting here. We have another external vendor, those rows sitting over there, and they are in a competitive relationship at your place. Do you want them to share a share to have a share kernel? Hell no. You don't want that. Because you will have this thing will become toxic. Yeah? This will be a, a play ball for political foul play, for political games, for a bunch of nonsense that you really don't want to have in that situation. Yeah? So one thing, when two teams have a shared kernel, they have to form a partnership. That's another context map pattern, actually. Yeah? So with a partnership, yeah, you don't want those teams to be in an enemy ship. Yeah? You want them to have a partnership so that they coordinate their planning, their development. They need a joint management for integration, testing, rolling things out. Yeah? Highly dependent, highly recommended for teams that have a shared kernel. Is that a team dependency that I want to have when I want to move towards autonomous teams or highly autonomous teams? 
Probably not. But moving yeah, from highly dependent teams to autonomous teams never works like, boom, oh, I've been at DDD Europe, and tomorrow we do autonomous teams. Yeah, it would be... Uh, so <laughs> please don't think that. No, that's a, a long-term plan that takes months and years. And you need to move to that state in stages. So this can also be used that you visualize where you are currently at, where you need to address certain things in that area. Yeah? So this can also be seen as visualizing a status quo and having some terms to describe a certain status quo so that you can move away from that. Yeah? So please see that as well from that perspective. And I have another question for you. Which comments apply best regarding to the team in the middle, which has a lot of partnership relationships to the other teams on the outside? So, let me show your results. So obviously that team sits in a hell lot of meetings, yeah? They are living in meetings, so to say. Yeah? They don't get any work done, yeah? Because they, they are stuck in, in, they can't even drive their own agenda, yeah? Because they need to coordinate, coordinate, coordinate. Um, I tend to disagree that they are in a powerful position. Yeah? Um, maybe that can apply very rarely, yeah? but in practice I've never seen that happening yeah? because they are mostly driven by others and it's hard to prioritize things for them. Yeah? Um, another pattern yeah, that also um, is a very interesting one is the customer-supplier relationship between teams. What do I mean with that? Customer supplier only happens in upstream downstream relationships. Yeah? So when you have this power difference, that you have a very powerful upstream team and uh, yeah, helpless, as Eric Evans said it in his book, supplier team. Now, let's take a look at this example on that slide. We have one team which is responsible for the form where people can apply for a mortgage loan. Maybe some of you have applied for a mortgage loan yeah, in the past years, I'm pretty sure. And I'm pretty sure that this wasn't the nicest user experience around. Yeah, you have to fill out a lot of crap for the bank and they wanna, you need to let down your pants and they wanna know everything from you in order to be able to assess the risk. So, and then we have the scoring team, yeah, which computes a score where we say we would grant probably grant a credit to Michael or not. Now, that's a clear upstream-downstream relationship. But now think, who is actually responsible for the complexity of that form? Is it really the credit sales funnel team that owns the form? Because if, if I think, how are they driven? They are probably driven by mortgage loan applications brought in. Yeah. So, hey, whoa, we, we gained 100 applications for a mortgage loan yesterday. That's great. And we were able to increase that metric by 20% over the last three months. That's great. How could they do that? By having very simple forms. However, there is another team that says, oh, we are really sorry, but we need more data in that form in order to be able to assess that risk. And that is the scoring team. Now, they are downstream. Usually they can't make that claim. Now what do we do? We introduce a customer supplier relationship. We say, okay, we allow the scoring team some influence, and what is very important, some influence, on the planning of the upstream team. So we give them the allowance that they can go to the, let's say, there is a contract for that. So they can go once a year to the credit sales funnel team and tell them, hey, 
we want those two new fields in the application form, but you can toss the other one. We don't need that anymore for a certain new scoring rule. Or they can do that when they have a new requirement by an external regulator. Yeah? When e external regulators come up with something, they always need to fulfill that. Yeah? So we give, we grant with the customer supplier relationship, we grant the downstream team a certain degree of influence on the planning of the upstream team. So we strengthen their position a little bit. This is not a technical pattern. This is an organizational pattern. Yeah? You can't see this pattern in code. Yeah? However, there is also an anti-pattern variant to that. And I call that vetoing customer and helpless supplier. Yeah, that's the customer down there that usually doesn't come up with new requirements, new ideas, but that's just the, this, this customer down there that says, Oh no, we don't have the time. Oh no, our risk is too high. Yeah? So that's to a certain and, and they have the power to block the other team in doing stuff. Yeah? Um, take a look at that context map here. So we have one supplier and a bunch of pus, uh, customers uh, in the downstream. Which statements would you consider to be valid for this scenario? What do you think? Right, so let's hide the image and show your results. Yeah, that team is obviously driven by customers. Yeah, they can't drive, they can't master their own thing. Think about this autonomy mastery purpose thing. I think that's also not an autonomous team. Yeah? Um, and they will spend a lot of effort in prioritizing things. I think they will make no customer happy at all. Yeah, that's plain impossible. Yeah. Um, now, what we had was should introduce an open host service in addition to the customer supplier relationship. That brings me to a quick hint. An open host service is usually aimed at um, a variety of downstream clients. Now, when you start adding customer supplier relationships to an open host service, you may end up in very difficult situations. So. Hint from my side as a, a future scenario. I would usually avoid customer supplier relationships against open host services yeah, because I want to have strengthen the team that is applying yeah, this interface, this API that should solely be owned by that team, especially if you have a mixture of an open host service and some teams being in a customer supplier position and others being not in there. Yeah? You have the uh, uh, remote control. I will show you a scenario later on which addresses in, in exactly that. And that's where I would say, my, from my perspective, the correct answers would be those over there. Yeah? You should introduce an open host service instead of those customer supplier relationships. I think that's uh, a way better idea there. All right. Now, a pattern which I will uh, mention briefly is separate ways. Yeah? This is a pattern that you only have in the team relationship, in the team dependency free. You remember the uh, calendar software example? Yeah. Those teams, they went separate ways. But there is also another twist to this. Um, this can also be seen yeah, as something where you don't have a technical integration between two systems, yeah, because this is expensive. This causes a lot of effort. And um, you'd rather go with manual processes to address that. Yeah? So um, uh, let me give you an example. I see that very often in call center systems of systems. 
yeah, very often. So you have the call center agents, and they work with three or five systems in parallel when they get a call. And they enter one system, copy data, and then Alt-Tap, Alt-Tap, Alt-Tap. Yeah, I already see someone laughing here and <laughs> doing this. So. And then pasting the data in there again. Yeah? That happens very often. So there is no direct integration between the systems that you can see in the code. No, this is an organizational integration. Now, when you are transforming IT landscapes, you want to see that. Yeah, you want to be able to describe that. Because when you change something and this doesn't work, the call center may break. A sit situation where you probably don't want to be in. Yeah? So that's separate ways. Yeah? And then there is a pattern. Um, we only have two more left. Yeah? So uh, we're, we're getting to the end of all these pattern descriptions, which I consider to be very interesting, but which is also, in my eyes, rather vaguely described in the Blue Book and also the Red Book, a yeah, Red Book by Von Vernon. That's called published language. So per definition, um, the published language is a well-documented language which is shared between bounded contexts and from which bounded contexts can translate in and out of that. So, for instance, why are those calendar teams from Apple, Google and Microsoft so independent? Because they work with a published language called iCalendar. You, you know those .ics files in your emails. Yeah, those are data files that that provide data in a certain format, and everyone can translate in and out of them. Yeah? So that makes those teams independent. Now, the vagueness here yeah, is in the way um, how you see that in correlation to an open host service. For instance, if you take into the publications by Vaughan, uh, take a look into the publications by Vaughan Vernon, he only has images that show a published language next to an open host service. So you see many images, OHS slash PL, yeah? which stands for published language. So that may lead to the understanding that an open host service always has a published language. Yeah? I mean, I, I know the perspective where this is coming from. So in the moment, you publish a part of your own ubiquitous language through the open host service. So that's one perspective that you can have. Um, I'm very honest, and this is my personal opinion here. Yeah? So that's not backed up by a book or anything like that. Maybe expect for my own DDT book. <laughs> um, I think I expect from an open host service to have a well-documented interface and a well-documented language. So I think that's something that I expect as a part of a definition of done for an open host service. Yeah? I don't want to have an interface that says, oh, just go with it and do whatever you want with that. I think there is no added value. I think a published language, and that's how the way I use it, I would see those patterns also as heuristics. So that gives you some flexibility. How I treat that very often, that this is something like a standard, where there's a committee involved of some teams. Yeah? I mean, for iCalendar, there is a standard. Yeah? The RFC for iCalendar. The same applies to vCard, when you send your, the telephone number of your best friend to another friend. Yeah? So, and I would say this is the published language here, and that's a perspective that works very well with me. So if you want to get into the calendar app business, you can get started right away with the big names. You just need to apply or implement that published language, with, which is iCalendar, yeah? and you're good to go. When you really have the greatest calendar app in the world, someone will knock on your door. <coughs> Do you want to sit in the committee? Yeah? You're doing good stuff. We'd like to have you in there, where you buy yourself into that committee. Yeah? And you get an influence on that. So I would say published language is a little bit more. So for instance, the, the, the model from the Google Maps API, in my eyes, is not a published language. It's just Google's model, which they drive, which they influence, yeah? and which they publish over their open host service. If you do the same, you'll probably get sued by Google. Yeah? And that's something you probably don't want to be. Yeah. Um, now, the last pattern, I would say, is a pattern that we have all, at least once, in our career built on our own. But of course, only in our previous jobs, not at the current employers. Yeah? Because at our current employers, everything is perfect, and we are not building a big ball of mud there. Yeah? 
So everything's perfect in our current employment. That's uh, from our dark past. Yeah, um, that's a pattern that Vaughn added to the red book, and mm, I would say, personally, I, I'm not so sure if this is well placed in the context mapping session section. Yeah, so that's a part of a system where model boundaries are not clear, where the language is well, wishy-washy, vague, and this is mostly a warning sign. So. You don't want to have a shared kernel with an open host service. You don't want to conform to the model, yeah, or let's say the spaghetti mess of a model of an open host service. Uh, you want to have ACLs against open host services. Yeah. So let's sum this up a little bit. In my eyes, you can visualize different perspectives with context maps, and you don't need to visualize all perspectives at once. So if you're just interested in a certain perspective, you just pick the patterns from that perspective. So you can start off with call relationships, something you probably already have. Yeah? And then you can take a look at the first level in team relationships or team dependencies, upstream, downstream, for instance. Yeah? You can say, oh, where do we have APIs? Where are our open host services? How about the model propagation yeah, with anti-corruption layer, conformist, and so on? And yeah, finally, a deep dive into team relationships. Where do we have partnerships? Where do we have customer suppliers? And so on. And these patterns, yeah, they map to certain different perspectives as well. Yeah? And um, also to team dependencies. So for instance, partnership, shared kernel, is something that you usually see in mutually dependent teams. Free teams very often work with, with published languages separate ways. Yeah? And upstream, downstream is something that you very often find with customer supplier, anti-corruption layer, conformist, open host service. So there is also a mapping on that. Yeah? And also keep in mind the team communication. Yeah? So shared kernel, customer supplier, conformist, they are high communication bandwidth patterns. So you have a high degree of organizational coupling. Whereas the other ones, yeah, they are more tailored towards a lower communication bandwidth. Now, let me show you an, uh, this example again. We have an open host service with a bunch of anti-corruption layers. Looks great, doesn't it? Now, one customer is always vetoing changes on the open host su uh, service. What happens? <laughs> if the systems X and Y are dependent on those changes for the development of their further features and functionality and product increments, they will get blocked in their progress because of set, saying, no, the risk on the open host service is too high for us. I've seen that as a piece of a political foul play. Uh, sorry, uh, because one manager, uh, there was a round where someone, some of the mid managers was about to get promoted. And so this manager from system set was always saying, no, no, risk is too high for changes. And then in the interviews for the promotion round, told the HR department, well, I get a, a ton of releases out. I get my stuff going. But the managers for, from X and Y, they don't get stuff done. Yeah? They always need to postpone. Yeah, why? Because he was blocking them indirectly. Yeah? Something we actually found out by drawing context maps. Yeah? He didn't get promoted. <laughs> So let's take a look at a more complex thing. Yeah? Check this context map out here. So I call this context map the model propagation from the gates of hell. Yeah? Why? So what can happen there? So we have a rating model, which moves through a conformist into the scoring bounded context. And then we have another shared kernel, and it can propagate probably to the credit application thing. And the same can happen with the customer model as well. Oh, ugly stuff. Yeah, that's not so easy to fix. Yeah, so that's not a quick fix. You want to know that when you want to revamp your application landscape. Yeah? This is high risk stuff here. I would start by breaking up the shake shake kernel first. Yeah, probably. Now, there's one more thing that I want to give you. We with subdomains, and yeah, we have those domain categories. Maybe you heard about core domains, supporting subdomains, generic subdomains. Yeah. 
Maybe you have bounded context sitting in a core domain, which is super important. We have other ones in generic subdomains that are not so important, where you don't have a lot of passion for. Yeah? Um, there is also a helper on the DDD crew site that can help you with this stuff. Yeah? And as a last exercise for you, I would like, uh, you should ask some questions. Yeah? Should a generic or a supporting subdomain be a customer for a supply in a core domain? Yeah? Um, how to deal with a big ball of mud in a core domain? Conform it to other categories and so on? Yeah? So that's not so, uh, not so easy stuff. And to wrap this talk up as a last thing, I have this scenario for you. What are your thoughts on a core domain conforming to an external system? What do you think? You can write some text here. I'll give you half a minute. Is this a good idea? Bad idea, very dangerous. Hell, yeah. Hell ain't a bad place to be. Maybe there are some ACDC fans out there. <laughs> it's a song by ACDC. <laughs> um, need to implement an anti-corruption layer. Weak to position to be, be in. Yeah. Oh. So let's see. Been there. It's hell. Other domains bleeding into your own core domain. Yeah. Bad idea, stupid idea. Depends, but generally bad. Yeah. This is an utterly bad idea. Yeah. Because why? You're dependent on the agenda of the provider of the external system in your core domain. That's the last thing you want to be in a core domain. There, you want to drive your own stuff. Yeah? And as an outlook, yeah, as an outlook to these things, we're getting to the end of the session. There is also a different perspective on that. And I know there are a bunch of talks on this in the main conference as well. Maybe you want to check out the team topology stuff by Matthew Emmanuel. You can greatly combine team topologies and context maps as well to get an even better insight yeah, on these things. And yeah, two more resources. I think you definitely should check out the context mapping project on the DDD crew site on Twitter. There, I have provided for you a context mapping cheat sheet under Creative Commons, yeah, which you can print out on big paper and whatever when you do want to work with that, with definitions and visualizations. And there is also a, a, a starter kit for Miro where you can get started with context mapping right away. Yeah? So you can download the board backup, it's Creative Commons, do whatever you want with that. Yeah? And you can get started, there's buttons and stuff for all the patterns in there. And if you want to dig deeper, yeah, there's even bigger parts of that context mapping quiz, also published on the DDT crew site on GitHub. Yeah, so I took out some examples from that in this talk. But if you want to get deeper and play around with your own team, get your hands dirty, that may be a good starting point. Yeah, and uh, maybe yeah, so you're interested in applying that stuff to you. I will do a free two-hour context mapping online session on July the 5th for all attendees of DDD Europe. The voucher for that is in your goodie bags because InnoQ is a sponsor. So please sign up to that. And um, I will also publish the slides on speaker deck of that talk so you can refer back to them. And yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, I do trainings and uh, consulting on all these things. So if you're interested in that, you can hit me up. And I'll be around at the conference till Friday late afternoon. So uh, you can come up to me with questions and remarks and feedback and so on. And for the time being, I want to thank you very much for the attendance. And I'm glad that the questionnaire worked out with our slides. Thanks for participating in that. And I wish you a great rest of the conference. Please enjoy DDD Europe. Thank you very much. And here is Eduardo.